Let's work out an example of calculating Moran's eye manually for this small math pattern that we have in front of us. In this case, each of our polygons, A through F, have a, uh, an X value indicated by this number over here. These are our data values, and these are our labels for our different zones in the map. This L is the number of links each polygon has when we have a when we use a rook connectivity structure. So neighborhood C has a value of 2.4, and we see that it's connected to one, two, three, four neighboring regions. The first thing that we're going to do is construct a binary rook matrix for this connectivity structure. So let's look at neighborhood A and which zones are A neighbor to. We see that A shares a boundary with B and C. So we're going to put ones in these two locations to denote that neighborhood A is neighbors with B and C and we'll put zeros everywhere else on that row. B is neighbors to A, C, and D. C is neighbors to A, B, D, and E. D is neighbors with B, C, E, and F. E is neighbors with C, D, and F. And F is neighbors with D and E. And again, we have to put zeros everywhere else. So now we have our weight matrix. And in the formula for Moran's I, we have to know the sum over all I's and all J's of W, I, J. In other words, we have to add up all the values in this matrix. And when we do that, we see that the sum of all of these ones is equal to 18. So that sum of sum of W appears, say, over here in the numerator, in the denominator of this first fraction. The next thing that we're going to have to do is calculate all of our uh, deviations. So in order to calculate the denominator, we need to know the sum over xi minus x bar squared. So for each x, we are going to calculate x minus x bar. We found that x bar is 1.7. And we just are going to do the normal uh, calculation of the deviance and the deviance squared. So 2.6 minus 1.7 is 0 0.9, and we square that to get 0.81. So this denominator over here is just the sum of this column, which we find to be 10.32. This n over here is just the number of observations we had. We had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this was 6. The sum of sum of w was 18. In here, we had 10.32. But now we need to calculate all of the cross product terms and multiply them by the weights. In order to do that, we can visualize the numerator as a matrix. So let's visualize it as a matrix where we are keeping track of the i's down the rows and the j's across the columns. So what we have is the sum over all i and all j of w i j times the two cross products. And w i j is that binary weight matrix. So we know right away that wherever w i j equals zero, this entire cross product term for that specific ij will equal zero. So we're going to put zeros in all the same locations where we had zeros 
in our original W matrix. So everywhere we have zeros here, we're going to have zeros there. Where we have ones in the W matrix, we're going to place the cross product term, or we're going to put one times the cross product term. So for example, area, and before I had these as A through F, whoops, C, D, E, F, A, just so that you don't get confused. It's very uncommon that we use letters instead of numbers to, to refer to locations, but I'll write the, the letters down here. So A was neighbors with B. So what we are going to have in this cell of the matrix is XA minus X bar, which is now just D1 minus, which is D1, and XB minus X bar, which is D2. And the weight of 1 with 2 was equal to 1. So we don't actually write it down, but we know we also have a 1 multiplying this thing. So this D1, D2 is just X1 minus X bar times X2 minus X bar. Over here, as another example, we had locate the location E and D being neighbors. So for that pair of neighbors, we need to calculate its cross product term, which is just going to be X5 minus X bar, so that's D5, the deviation for point 0.5, and XJ minus X bar, which is D4, the deviation for uh, location 4, or location D. So we're going to go ahead and fill out this entire matrix, and on this page we're just showing you the schematic of what all of these entries are going to contain. And the next step is actually to fill in and replace these D1s, these deviances, with the actual values that we have from our table of deviances over here. So this is D1, this is D2, D3, D5, and D6. So over here, where I call for D1 times D2, we're going to multiply 0 0.9 times minus 1.2, D1 times D2, and place it in this cell. So that is equal to minus 1.08. And we do that for each of the cross product terms that have non-zero weights. So we're calculating the cross products for neighboring locations. And now we have to sum them all up. And when we sum them all up, we find that the sum of the cross product terms is minus 5.66. Now what does that mean? It means that more often than not, when xi and xj are neighbors, xi and xj don't have the same, uh, aren't similar values. So more often than not, when xi is above the mean, xj is below the mean, and we end up with negative cross product terms. And we, if we add up all of the cross product terms, overall we find that the sum is negative. So right away we know that Moran's i is also going to be negative. Moran's i is going to be negative, so we'll have negative autocorrelation. Let's just calculate the rest of the statistic. So we had n, which was 6. We had n over the sum of sum of w, which was 18. 6 over 18. Then we had the sum of the cross product terms, minus 5.66, and the, and the sum of squared deviances, which is 10.32. And that ends up with a Moran's i of minus 0.183 just some weak negative spatial autocorrelation. If we wanted to know whether or not this Moran's i was statistically different to zero, we would have to standardize it into a z-score using z equals e minus the expected value of i over the square root of the variance of i. Now the expected value of i, if the data were random, we only have six observations 
e of i equals minus 1 over n minus 1 equals minus 1 fifth equals minus 0 0.2. So the expected value in such a small sample size is minus 0 0.2. We have an i of minus 0 0.183. So even though we don't we aren't going to compute the full z-test because we don't have an estimate of the variance in this case. I'm pretty sure that this isn't going to be significantly different to this random case. And in fact, we would conclude in this case that despite i being less than zero, it's not significantly different to this random i that we would expect to see. And therefore, uh, we would fail to reject a null hypothesis of randomness in this case. Here we have the Moran scatter plot of x versus the neighborhood average of x. And here we see that the best fitting line through the cloud of points is a negative sloping line. So we do have a negative level of autocorrelation. But we also see that the scattering of points around this line is really, really loose. We don't have a nice, tight, linear pattern, which would give us a Moran's eye close to minus one. Instead, we have this really loose pattern, which gives us a Moran's eye close to zero, 0 0.18.